This is Still a Part of Us, a podcast where moms and dads share the story of their child who was stillborn or who died in infancy. I'm Winter Red, and in this episode of Advice and Encouragement from a Lost Mom, I chat with Megan, whose daughter Henley was stillborn at 36 weeks. By the way, you can hear Megan's and her husband Scott's episodes about the birth of their child on episodes 29 and 31. Today, we discuss with Megan how she makes it a point to tell Henley's story and the warnings she has for other pregnant women, how she encourages other lost parents to do what is right for them and to not let anyone else try and change anything, and how she and her husband have drawn closer to one another after losing Henley. As a word of caution to our listeners, this discussion contains emotional triggers of stillbirth and infant loss. Please keep yourself emotionally and mentally healthy and seek help if needed. Hope this helps someone out there. Megan, thank you so much for being on this episode with me. I really appreciate you coming on, telling Henley's story, and it was beautiful. And I, it was so similar to ours, so it's just like, oh, just heartbreaking. So I'm so sorry that that has happened to you and your your family, but thank you for sharing because I I feel like you actually, I I know you have something to share that I think is extremely important. You mentioned it already in the birth episode. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to that, go back and listen to Megan's story. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And for context, can you tell us um, about how long ago your child was born at the time of this recording? So she was born just under four months ago, just under four months ago. So, and so you're, you're kind of still in the very new stages, Megan. Um, How has the grieving process looked like for you? Um, every day is different. I mean, the beginning was really hard. There was lots of crying. There was, you know, just lots of days spent not wanting to do much. Um, as time's gone on, it's, it's getting, I wouldn't call it easier, but I'm more able to do the normal things you got to do. Like, you know, I went back to work and, you know, you kind of just have to move on with the day to day, but you know, not necessarily do I cry every day, but there's definitely at least a couple of times a week, something out of the blue will strike that brings it all right back. Yeah. Anything. It feels like. It oh, can... it can be just the most random of things. Yeah. Like anything. it doesn't, there's no rhyme or reason to it. And sometimes like this last trip, we went on to Disneyland. Um, I started crying in the line for the Incredicoaster and I have no idea why. <laughs> I couldn't tell you, like, you know, Scott looked at me and he's, what what's making you upset? And I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. You're like, I can't tell you. It just happens. So what have you done? Um, you mentioned before that you like to go and sit in her room sometimes and rock um, on her rocking chair and maybe even sit with that little weighted teddy bear. Um, other things, what are some other things that you like to do to, to think about her, to remember her, to celebrate Henley on a day-to-day basis? I mean, it's my goal to anyone that's willing to listen gets told about her. Um, and Anyone that I know that is pregnant or intends to be gets told her story, not to scare them, but to tell them the things I wish I would have known that might have made a difference. Yeah. Cause you, Um, can you, I, I, can you tell us exactly what you tell people? I actually want you to say it again on this episode too, because I think it's super important. I tell the whole story to pretty much everyone. I mean, I even have a friend currently that lives out of state, but she's pregnant and I didn't know, but she knew she was pregnant when I told her I lost Henley. Yeah. So she's 22 or 23 weeks pregnant right now. So immediately she tells me, she didn't tell me until like two weeks ago. um, But when she told me, my first thing was, okay, I don't want this to scare you. And I'm not telling you to scare you, but the doctors don't tell you. And you need to know if your baby has a, you know, you get to know their movement pattern. You get to know what their kicks feel like. If they start moving erratically a lot crazy intensely, please go get checked out. Even if you get there, they check everything and they tell you you're crazy. I would rather have you find out that everything was fine than be me who didn't know. And had I known, I could have maybe saved her. Yeah, that is so, so important. I, that was the thing that struck me when you emailed me was um, your kind of emphatic plea. Like, I want people to know this. I need people to know this. I need women to know this so that they can take care of their babies. Cause I even took the time and asked my doctor 
well, I didn't ask my doctor, but I asked another doctor why they don't tell women this. So even when- though I'm not the only one that I know that has had this right. and then had something happen. And basically I got told by this doctor that if they told all women that any kind of erratic movement could be a sign of distress, they'd have people in getting checked every two minutes. And it's just highly unlikely that that's what it is. Now, mind you, this wasn't actually my doctor. This was just another doctor that I was talking to because I don't think my doctor would be that callous or cold. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But it just makes no sense to me. I mean, so what we're wasting the hospital's time a certain percentage of the time, but how many babies is it going to make a difference in? Exactly. Like it's worth it. It totally is worth it. I, that, mm. (laughs) ah, that's frustrating. It really is. It's, that's frustrating. So I, obviously I didn't have a reason to think anything of it. Also just had no knowledge first pregnancy. I didn't know. Yeah. And that's, Um, and everything had been so healthy and so fine. Yeah, exactly. They'd been checking you out. You'd looked great. And I, yeah, it's frustrating when you're like, kind of takes your innocence away, right? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I've gotten to a place now where I know I can't live in the land of what if. I can't keep thinking, well, if I had done this, maybe this would happen. Or if this had happened, I can't can't live there because I can't change it. So the best I can do is try and tell everyone else to hopefully prevent something bad from happening to someone else. Yeah. I like that. Not living in the land of what if, because that will eat you up. It will. It will totally eat you up. Is there anything you guys do? And I'm, I think I know the answer to this um, that you guys try and do to like physically escape and trying to basically take your mind off of it. Why we go to Disneyland. You go to Disneyland. <laughs> I was like, I know you're going to say that. Thing. Which I think is great. The um, first trip back after losing Henley was rough. Um, I wasn't even sure I wanted to go. I wasn't sure how it would be. I didn't know if my happy place would be ruined. Um, It was hard, um, you know, seeing people with their children, thinking about all the things we thought we'd have her there for was hard. But in the end, we did have a good time and it was still enjoyable to us. And we've been back additionally another time since then now. And, you know, I made it through this last trip. I only cried one time and I had a good time the rest of the time. So it's still the place that we go to be happy. Good. Yeah. That's, yes, watching and seeing all the other little families with their little babies and then kind of the once again the what ifs like oh Henley would be able to you know do this and do that and yes there's a lot of we really hope that one day that will be fulfilled with another child obviously it never will be with Henley but one day we'll get there with a baby yeah 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 (laughs) Megan do you guys um go to counseling or any grief support groups or Um, anything like that we've been to the support group that our hospital runs, the hospital I delivered at. Um, We went once and it's bi-monthly. So they actually have it every month, but one month it's on one side of town and then one month it's, you know, 40 miles in the other direction. Right. We didn't go to the very first one because it was like the week after I had her and I was like, I just can't go there yet. (laughs) Uh, So we went the next month and then they didn't have one. They had a memory tree event in December where they have people bring in ornaments for their babies And they get hung on a tree that stays in the hospital lobby all through Christmas. So we did go to that. Nice. We actually, when we were at Disneyland, picked up an ornament, had her name put on it and everything. And that's that hung in the hospital through the Christmas season. And they'll put it up every subsequent year. Oh, Um, that's great. put all the ornaments back up. And then there's another group, the grief support group. There's another one in the next month. So we'll go to that one. Um, That was pretty helpful. And then I started counseling for the first time last week. So I've only gone once. Yeah. But um, I felt like I found the right counselor. I found someone who not only specializes in this situation, but also has personally been through it. So experienced to stillbirth herself. Yes. Um, she said about two years ago. Oh, that's that's pretty recent for her, too. If you think it's about it. It's impressive to me that she's willing to counsel others. Yeah, about exactly. The same thing. Exactly. Well, that is that's great. And I, I we've. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of therapy. I mean, and so, and especially shopping around for somebody that is a good fit. And it sounds like. Yeah, I had, I actually had tried another place first and I just didn't like, it was one of those, like you walk in and you're just like, Mm, not feeling it. You're like, 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 this is not going to (laughs) work. I already know. I don't know what it is. (laughs) Um, Exactly. And so the way I came about this therapist was actually very unique. Um, I was at story time at the library with my friend's daughter. I was babysitting my friend's daughter. And had brought her to story time. And I, 
I somehow ended up in a conversation with these other moms talking about their C-sections and I'm just not shy. So I just interject with mine. And I mean, obviously through the course of the story, they find out that, you know, Henley was stillborn yeah. and um, not, didn't really think much of the conversation, just kind of said some things. They were just kind of impressed that I was there, you know, and then we went into story time and that was the end of that. Don't even know these people's names. Talk to them for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. The next time I came back to the library, now mind you, this library, the librarians know me because I'm a nanny and I've brought lots of kids. To You're there. Now. You're there. So they've, they've seen me with a rotating group of children and so they know who I am. The librarian comes up to me and says, oh, I'm waiting for you to come back in. You know, this woman that you talked to the last time you were here, she left this for you. She left me a whole letter like four pages long about her story, about things that had happened to her. She had had loss, not stillbirth, but earlier loss. And then said, you know, I don't know if you've thought of this, but I've been going to this counseling place and they've helped me immensely. And they specialize this in this and left the brochure for the counseling center. That is amazing. So it's just another case of where like talking about it is worth it. Yeah. You know, as much as you'll make some people uncomfortable, there are so many people that have a story that aren't willing to say it and tell you start the conversation. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, that's, this is why we have the podcast. <laughs> so we well, can talk and then about I, it. I personally, so my husband and I both got tattoos after we lost. Henry yeah. Yeah. And put them in a very visible place and it's, it's intentional. It's on my left forearm uh -huh. on the inside. So, you know, if I'm handing anybody anything, they're going to see it. And it's, it's intentional for people to read it and ask a question. So my tattoo says Henley Ryan, I carried you every second of your life and I will love you for every second of mine. And it has um, my birth flower and hers. Oh, that is awesome. Oh, look at that. Uh, there you go. Oh, that's so cool. So I, I intentionally put it there so that, it, you know, there are people that read it and just you tell they get the like eh, look on their face and then don't say anything. But there's a lot of people that read it and go, oh, my tell God, me about that's yeah. so sweet. What happened? And I, I, I totally want you to ask what happened. That's why I put it there. Yeah. I put it there. So you'll ask me. Yeah. Does your husband have it in kind of a similar location? He's got a tattoo on the same spot. Oh, really? Um, his okay. tattoo says something else. Uh -huh. Got a different quote. And his tattoo instead of flowers has her actual footprint. Oh, really? Yeah. Yay. That's awesome. That, uh, yeah. I, those physical reminders actually are, I think, very helpful. My husband has a tattoo as well. And um, that's, the, he has it on his forearm so people can ask him about it. And it's, been we, good for we got him. him done about four weeks after we lost her. Yeah. I, as soon as I thought my, well, I didn't even ask my doctor. I was just like, what's the worst that's going to happen? She's going to yell at me. I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're as soon as I felt up to it, I was like, I'm doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> I'm curious what you would say to somebody that is experience this, experiencing a loss like this, that anything that you found comfor comforting to you that you heard that you would maybe want to pass on to somebody else? I mean, the best advice I can give is take all the pictures, um, take, you know, take all the moments you can make sure you dress them, make sure you bring, you know, if you had a specific like swaddle blanket picked out that you were like, I'm going to use this for my baby, put it on them and take a picture. Yeah. Because these are the things that like, you'll regret not having them down the line. Yeah. Um, call the professionals, let them come take great quality photos for you. And no matter what you think anyone else is going to think about it, spend as much time as you want to with that baby. Yeah. It's totally up to you. Um, I don't regret my choice. I mean, I wish I would have spent a little longer with her, but I don't regret what we did. It felt right at the time. Okay. And then there, you know, there's other people that want to spend the full 48 hours they'll give if they have a cuddle cot and that's fine. Yeah. You do what feels right to you. Yeah. Don't let anybody else aside from you and your partner influence that decision. That is great advice. I have found that different people want to spend, yeah, exactly, 48 hours or however long that they will let you have them. And then others were like, that was good. I need to, I need for myself closure. And they. We gave her back when we did because she had started leaking fluid out of her nose mm -hmm. and she just wasn't going to look the same. Yeah. And that's. And hard. I wanted the last memories to be of her looking as good as she could. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know, it's it's a personal choice it and is. don't let anybody else try and change how you feel about it. Yeah. Yes. Now, Megan, what would you not say to somebody that's experiencing <sighs> such a loss? 
well, we've had some things that people say that I think that no one should ever say to people. <laughs> Don't call anybody I, out by name, but go ahead. No, and I would no. love to hear this. Um, well, and these aren't like specific people yeah. that we're close to. This is just like, you know, in the course of people on the street. Yeah. Right. No matter your religious beliefs, whether you're religious or not, we're not. Some people are. That doesn't matter. Fine. Don't ever tell someone it was God's plan. Don't do it. Hey, no matter how much you believe that, it's not comforting in any way, shape or form. No, no, not at all. I mean, you can tell me that, you know, you're praying for me and that that, fantastic because that means you're thinking good things for me. Yeah. Awesome. Don't ever say that it was God's plan. Don't tell me everything happens for a reason. Oh, yeah. Hate that one, too. (laughs) These are not good things to say. They're not comforting. And if you don't know what to say at all, just say you're sorry. Yeah, that's huge. I love when people say, I'm so sorry about what happened. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. That's horrible. Yeah. Yep. Yes. That's that's enough. If you can't think of anything else, that's enough. You said something. Yeah. (laughs) And you thought about me. So that's good. Yeah. And don't, you know, the other thing that was, that that I think now is hard is don't, don't not say anything because you don't know what to say. Don't just disappear because you don't know what to say. I know it makes you uncomfortable. It makes everyone uncomfortable. I'm going to be uncomfortable for the rest of my life. Yeah, I've got this with me. But you've got to say something. Don't just ignore the existence. Yeah. Like, say something. And I, I finally, I posted on social media a couple of days ago. I posted something telling people that I want them to ask me about her. Oh, I want them to say things. I got tired of everybody just kind of like skirting around the subject. So and there I was, was like, a lot Fine. of people. This is what we're doing. So it was it was there was a lot of people kind of tiptoeing around. Oh, lots of people dancing around not wanting to ask anything. And I'm like, just just ask. The most comforting thing you can do is ask me about her. Yeah. She existed. Yeah. I carried her. I gave birth to her. Oh yeah. And then we've had, you know, in conversations with other people, you know, kind of like I said when I jumped into that conversation at story time. I've had other conversations where I've jumped into somebody's conversation about pregnancy or birth, and you can tell it just makes them totally uncomfortable that I've jumped into this conversation. And I want to be like, look, just because I didn't bring a baby home doesn't mean I didn't have a baby. Yeah. Yeah. I went through the same thing. Yep. Yep. The only difference is your C-section ended with a baby crying and mine ended with silence. Yeah. Yep. You still gave birth. Yep. You carried her. Yeah, and you'd be surprised how many people are totally uncomfortable with with that thought. That. <laughs> yeah. Or sure. the people that are just like, I don't want you to, you know, your your story makes me uncomfortable and I I just I can't talk about it. Well, then I guess you can't talk to me. Like, I guess we're done then. Yeah, cuz you're like this is part of who I am now. This is, what this is my about. life. Yeah. And if you'd like to be a part of my life, then this this is part of what we have to talk about. You know, it's interesting. I I listened to a TED talk and it um and it was a woman who had uh, experienced stillbirth and she's like the one thing about stillbirth is kind of like it's like a fire, a slow burning fire that it burns away all the stuff that doesn't really matter. And so sometimes those relationships and those things that really just don't matter kind of go away. Because you also kind of lose a lot of your filter for things. Yeah, you're just like um I'm I'm real blunt with people now. Yeah, yeah. You know and. And sometimes the hardest conversations that people have, they, they have it not meaning it for it to be a, a in-depth, very personal conversation. Yeah. You know, oh, do you have kids? You know, just the general, we're just trying to have a chit chat. And I don't lie. Yeah. So I answer and I respond, yes, I have a daughter, but I lost her at 36 weeks. And then they're uncomfortable and they don't know what to do now. Well, you ask the personal question. Yeah. So you get the answer. Yeah. If you didn't want the answer, don't ask the question. Yeah. It's- you could have just been like, How's, you know, oh, it's been hot outside today. You're like, <laughs> weather. Great. Yeah, the weather. <laughs> you chose to ask the question. Don't be astounded by the answer. It is a very personal question. People don't realize it, but it's a very personal question. So it is. And I mean, it's, it's a personal choice on how you decide to answer. I refuse to say I don't have any kids. Yeah. But honestly, there are some times where I think about it. And sometimes I will. If I'm never going to see this person again and I've passed them in the grocery store for five seconds, sometimes I'll just be like, no, and then keep walking. Yeah. Because it's just sometimes it's exhausting to have to go through the call conversation or just deal with the people that like look at you. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Don't be like those people. Come on, people. (laughs) So how has Scott, your spouse, handled the loss? How how has that looked like for him and, and as a couple even? Um. I mean, he's been great. 
for me, but he definitely is a lot more quiet about it. Um, like any conversation about Henley is initiated by me, not initiated by him. Um, you know, everybody grieves differently and it's been difficult for me to sit there and realize that just because he's not grieving the same way I am doesn't mean he's not grieving, but I think we're closer than ever now. I mean, we have been through this and it's probably the hardest thing we'll ever deal with together. And we've been together for a long time now. Um, I mean, we started dating when we were 19 or 30. Well, I'm 32. He's almost 32 now. So it's been quite a while, almost 13 years. Um, so, you know, it's, every day is different and some days he does cry. Some days I he doesn't say anything about her at all and it's it's different for him than for me because I talk about her every day but you know he's never offended when I talk about her he never doesn't want to respond when I talk about her right I think he just doesn't choose to initiate those conversations right and that's fine that's just how he communicates that's what feels comfortable to him it sounds like yeah um, I, I'm sure his episode will be much less in depth on talking than mine. He just doesn't talk quite as much as most I most of the men's episodes are a little bit shorter, and that's perfectly <laughs> fine. I think kudos to you guys though for s- staying close to each other and maybe even getting stronger in your relationship I guess these these can shatter a relationship pretty easily. These kind yeah. of tragedies can be I very can see difficult. how it does, yeah. Because there's so much stresses, and then you're just like, "Why aren't you grieving like me?" and it's and it's frustrating. Yeah. so. I, I mean, I think it somewhat helped that we had been through some loss together prior to this. I mean, granted, it was my family and not his, but we've been together so long that my family is basically it's, his. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, he was he was pretty close to my grandmother when she passed away. And, and then um, when my dad passed away, he was actually the one that, that found my father. So oh. we've been through quite a bit together. Yeah, you have. Um. So you so mentioning these um, previous kind of deaths that you guys have experienced did you think that was kind of a little preparatory or did you I'm, I'm just curious well, like how you feel about having so, those experiences before Henley well so we thought that 2016 the year that both those people passed away was going to be the worst year ever right you get out of that and you go okay this is as bad as it can get can't get any worse than this well I don't think that way anymore because 2019 was worse than that yeah <laughs> but I think that I was able to handle the loss of Henley a little more gracefully after having been through what I already have. I kind of already knew how my body was going to deal with grief, how, how my brain handled it and, you know, was able to deal with things a little better. I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, it really prepares you, but at least I had some background on experience on losing someone. Yeah. No, this is so much more intense than that. Even though that was my father and my grandmother, it's still, this is more intense. Yeah. This is somebody that didn't ever really get to live at all. Yeah. Didn't get a chance to, yeah. <sighs> the death of dreams is what they call it is. <laughs> and I'm like, yep, yep, that's exactly what it feels like. I know it's been short of short four months, right? Yeah. Have you had any realizations or aha moments about how you grieve or just about the entire process that you're going through right now? Well, I have had people tell me that I'm kind of crazy because like I said, I am a nanny. Um, (laughs) I wasn't working when I, well, I was working at the beginning of my pregnancy and ended up losing my job because the family I was working for, the mother got laid off from her job and they couldn't afford to keep me. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So then I I tried to find a job for a while and finding a job while as a nanny while you're pregnant is just kind of next to impossible. That's rough. I'm Um, sure. So I watched my little cousins for the summer while they were out of school there. They're twins. They're nine years old. Mm -hmm. Um, So I watched them the whole summer while they were out of school. And it kind of gave me something to do in the meantime. And by the end of summer, I was really pregnant. So I was like, I I give up. I'm not going to try and find a job till after I have her. It's fine. Right. Like, so from the end of August until what was supposed to be the end of October, I was like, I'm just not going to work. I ended up finding a job. Well, I found the job at the end of December, but I actually started this job about two and a half weeks ago now. Okay. Um, and everybody thinks I'm crazy because the child I'm watching now is two and a half months old. <gasps> um, and she's a little girl. Oh. So essentially, for all intents and purposes, I was due October 29th with Henley. This little girl was born on November 9th. So it's there. exactly the same as what it should have been. Yeah. Um, which some days is tougher than others. Yeah. Um, to look at her and know, well, this is what she should have been doing. Yeah. This is about how big she should have been. 
But for me, it would have been weird to find a job doing anything else. Cause I had a moment where I thought about not going back to nannying and I've spent the last like almost eight years of my life helping raise other people's children. Yeah. So I couldn't fathom going and doing something else. Yeah. And as hard as it is some days to be with her, it's also healing in other ways to, to be with a baby, Yeah, you know, for three days a week, though, it's not my baby. I get to be helping care for someone's baby. So that, that desire and that, you know, need to fill your arms is at least getting catered to in some way. Yeah. I'm getting to do something with it. Yeah. Oh, so hard though. But that sounds like a little bit of a calling for you. It feels right, I guess. It feels right. And I think, you know, after what has happened to me, I'm probably the most attentive nanny to a baby that's ever existed. <laughs> I am now. sure um, you are. The, the intense anxiety and fear about something happening to a child is real. Yeah. And I'm probably 10 times more attentive than anybody else would be. <laughs> and it took, it took me a while to find a job because when I was looking for work, I refused to hide anything. Mm. So I refused to hide what had happened with Henley. And I was open about it. And I also refused to hide the fact that we do intend to try and have another child. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to get into a position where I got hired for a job and then got pregnant and somebody go, oh, we can't deal with that. Yeah. So I was honest and it took me a while to find a family to work for. But the family that hired me is very understanding. Um, This is their first child. Yeah. And they're totally okay with the whole situation. They're totally okay if I do end up pregnant. Like they're fine with it. That's great. And the job schedule, I mean, it's 10 hour days, but it's three days a week. So it's almost perfect if I do get pregnant to be able to squeeze in appointments and things. It just seemed like the absolute right fit. Yeah. Well, that is, that's a blessing that that came along. And obviously you were patient to, to wait for the right, right, <laughs> right, right yeah. opportunity, I guess. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Cause I've been looking for a job, a- job actively since I was cleared by my doctor six weeks after yeah. having Henley. So it took, you know, a two months. months. Yeah. It takes a while sometimes. Well, good. I think that's great that you're doing that. I I don't know if I could do that. That would. I know. I have I'll be honest. People that are like, I don't know how you manage. Yeah, I was like, I'm not sure how I would be able to do that. That would make me a wreck. I think I'm pretty sure. So. I know. I've talked to some people that are like, I couldn't be around a baby, and I'm like, uh, I guess everyone's different. It, it is. I and I was like, I I think I still have not held a baby since our son passed away. Just. I, I'm not really a baby holder either. So, <laughs> so I guess it's not too much out of the ordinary for me. So, um, I know that you're going to be coming up here on, you know, Mother's Day and Father's Day in the next couple of months. Are you, do you guys have anything planned? Are you kind of preparing for that or? Not really. I mean, we start the land of one year later, um, yeah. February 19th, because mm. February 19th was when I found out I was pregnant with Emily. Yeah. So we're kind of rolling into that. Yeah. It's been a year later about everything. Yeah. Um, but we really kind of haven't thought about it. I kind of have just ignored it, <laughs> to be honest. Sometimes it's sometimes it's easier, right? <laughs> uh. um, and also trying not to think about the, you know, like one year later, whatever. My husband's birthday is coming up and, mm-hmm. and we had found out right before his birthday. Yeah. And so I'm kind of just kind of, I'm just going to push that off to the side. We're just going to celebrate your birthday. <laughs> yeah. Like we're just going to not acknowledge that totally right now. Yeah. Sometimes you have to do that when you just can't deal. I also, you know, um, the the other hard thing, the, the day Henley was born is actually, there's a set of twins that I nannied for a full year um, from when they were like three months old until they were about 15 months. And I still see them regularly, yeah. friends with their parents now. Henley was born on their second birthday. Oh, really? Yeah. So... I don't know if that's hard, if that's going to be hard or if it's going to be good that I'm distracted in because, their birthday. Right. Well, so. it'll always be a special day. Just a word of warning. Like I would maybe just be aware of yourself on the day that you found out that she was born. Cause that, that day was rough for me when I found yeah. out my, my son was born. Cause then I gave birth to him the, the next day. So this conversation has been awesome and you've had some amazing things to say. And I'm so grateful. Like <laughs> how blunt you are and open you are about it because I it's sometimes um, people skirt around like you said skirt around tiptoe around the issue and so it's nice to I just don't think to... it helps anyone if you're not just no. honest yeah this is the way it is it kind of sucks or it doesn't whatever there are going to be good days and there's going to be bad days 
any yeah. any last pieces of advice? Take the time you need and and don't let anybody tell you how you should or shouldn't feel. It's I mean, clearly I I've been told that I'm very different than most in this situation and you know, I've had people tell me that was weird and I don't think it's weird. Everyone's different and everyone's going to deal with it differently. Yeah. Totally. We're There's all no different. wrong way to grieve. Nope. I think people yeah, make judgments of like you should be this way. No, it's we're all different. Mhm. And it's surprising sometimes. <laughs> yeah. It's surprising sometimes. Megan, thank you so much. This was so great. Like you are just, uh, I appreciate your honesty and um, sharing your heart. And thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Many, many, many thanks to Megan for a candid, honest story and discussion about Henley. I am also super appreciative that she is helping educate other women who are currently pregnant and trying to get the word out so that they can keep an eye on their babies and get them here safely. So thank you so much, Megan, for coming on the podcast today. Head over to our website, stillapartofus.com, where you can find the show notes, including a full transcript of this interview and any resources that were mentioned, where you can sign up for our short and helpful email newsletter, where you can learn how you can become a patron and support the work it takes to produce a show for just a few dollars a month. And lastly, where you can find out how to get in touch with us if you want to share your child's story on the show. One thing that we wanted to point out on this show is that you can go over to the show notes in your podcast player and find a link on how to donate a few bucks to help us keep the lights on so we can continue bringing these beautiful stories to you. The show was produced and edited by Winter and Lee Red. Thanks to Josh Woodward for letting us use his song, Vanishing Note. You can find him at joshwoodward.com. Lastly, subscribe to this podcast and share it with a friend that might need it and tell them to subscribe. Why? Because people need to know that even though our babies are no longer with us, they're still a part of us. Facebook just sounds like a drag. In my day, seeing pictures of people's vacation was considered a punishment. Betty White